If you wish to follow along in your Bibles, I'm reading from Matthew 22. The first 14 verses is the text for our sermon. <clears throat> Matthew 22, <clears throat> beginning with verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted livestock, and all are butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the Lord was enraged. And so the king was, excuse me, was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw there a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him out into outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Father in heaven, enable us, we pray, to glean from this parable all that you would have us understand and apply. Help us, Holy Spirit, to feed on your word richly and well. For your glory and our growth in grace, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ used parables in his public ministry. This is not news, I suspect, to any of you, nor a surprise. The disciples early in his public ministry asked him, why he used parables, and his basic answer is found in Matthew, it was to the effect that those whose hearts were hardened might hear and not understand, might see and not perceive. So there was a judgmental aspect to parables that we have to acknowledge, but it's also true that he spoke in parables again and again to make the profound understandable to give us aid and help in grasping this marvelous concept of the kingdom of heaven on earth and our inheritance in it if we believe in Jesus as our Redeemer and Lord. And the kingdom of heaven has so many different aspects that I believe none of us can grasp them all without the aid of the Spirit richly over time. Uh, and I, by all, I mean just the ones that are listed in the scripture, not those that may escape us from other parts that aren't parables. So we have this teaching device that I like to think of as a diamond with many facets, and each parable is a facet of the diamond. And this morning we come to one that is vast and strategic, a great wedding feast. And of course, I think most of you know that we have the teaching, which I will refer to later, of the wedding feast of the Lamb. But the idea of a king giving a feast for the wedding of his son is of a vastly different order 
than the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the sower. When I say order, I, by I mean the, the size of the concept. The idea of a farmer sowing grain in and of itself is fairly simple, not as complex as that of a great banquet being prepared for a notable event in the life of a ruler, the wedding of his son. So with that, uh, I remind you of a simple definition of a parable. It's an earthly account or sometimes an earthly story, but with a heavenly meaning. And one of my prayers is when I read a parable that its very simplicity will not seduce me into taking it lightly. For I propose there is no parable that Christ stated that is not profound. May God give us grace to appreciate that. So what are the elements of the parable itself? Well, I think they're fairly straightforward. We have a king who has prepared a great banquet, a wedding feast, with invited guests. And his messengers go out to the guests who've been invited, remind them that the feast has been prepared. And they, they come back, his messengers come back with the news that there's a general rejection of the king's invitation. And so the king deals with those that have murdered his messengers in destroying them, and then calls his servants together and sends them out to go into the highways and to bring in those who were not first invited, to constrain them to come in. And his hall is filled. And as the king comes in to survey his wedding guests, he spots one person there who does not have wedding clothes. And I suppose we could think of it a little bit like this, of somebody coming to a very well orchestrated wedding in flip-flops and sandals and t-shirt. Uh, people would consider that disrespectful and inappropriate, not necessarily. Uh, horrible, but certainly not showing a concern for the bride and the groom and respect and coming prepared. And so if we can multiply that and thinking of a king inviting guests and one showing up in old work clothes, perhaps from cleaning the barn or something like that, you get maybe a sense of the seriousness of it. And it's sufficiently serious that when the king asks this guest who's there improperly clothed, how he came to be there without wedding clothes, he's speechless, which implies a clear picture of the guest recognizing his dereliction is so severe that there is no answer that he can give to justify it and is severely punished. Well, there you have the elements of the parable. I think that's fairly straightforward. But what of the parable itself? Well, first of all, I would propose to each of us that it's good to think for a minute about history, both biblical history and secular history. That from the dawn of recorded history, from ancient times, notable events have been marked with feasts and banquets. Have they not? We know that. And uh, one of the things that has intrigued me, uh, and recently having snippets of time to read something of the history of Scotland, is the number of times the King of Scotland or the Kings of England summoned their lords and their notables to attend and it was considered an offense if you didn't, and sometimes a punishable offense, if you didn't uh, come to the king's banquet. And we have something of that in Scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, you have the account of Saul's anger when David did not appear at a banquet. And in Esther chapter 1, we know the anger of King Ahasuerus when his wife refused to come. And you might say, well, that's a corrupted analogy. Uh, I grant you, but when a king summons someone to a banquet for whatever reason, 
that is to be taken carefully. And I propose also that it's hard for us Americans sometimes to get a sense of the weight of kingly prerogative. And I think I mentioned this once before from this pulpit, that in Great Britain, if you have a passport, you don't have a passport as a citizen, you have a passport as a subject. Is that not correct? And that's not just some kind of vacant tradition. That reflects the fact that a king is understood in his kingdom to own not only the territory, but the people. And it's expected that those who are the king's own will respond to his bidding, whatever the circumstances. And so, for us Americans to wrap our mind around the idea that the king owns us can be a bit of a challenge, but it's a weighty one. And I remind you that Paul says to the Corinthians, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. And that's kingly language twice over, not only purchased, as, but as his capacity as Lord. Uh, he owns us body and soul, whether we admit it or not. So our Heavenly Father early on, has been summoning people to banquets. Would you turn, please, to Exodus chapter 12? Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 14. Now this day will be a memorial to you, namely the day of the observation of the Passover, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person that alone may be prepared for you. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. We're still doing it by observing the Lord's Supper in its New Testament replacement of the Old Testament administration of that feast. And then a passage that has for years been dear to my heart in Exodus chapter 24, which is quite remarkable, I believe. Verse 9 of chapter 24 of Exodus then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. Remarkable. There early in the history of the nation of Israel, the representatives of the people, 70 of the elders, along with Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, ate and drank in the presence of Almighty God. Remarkable. And then, if you will, please, to Luke 13. Verse 22. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter in by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to them, I do not know you. 
where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say to them, I, t I tell you, I do not know from where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. Then there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being cast out. And they will come from east and west and north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. So this idea of a king's feast goes from antiquity to the future that's in eternity. God, the ultimate king, continues to invite men and women to his feast. He continues to invite sinners to sup with him. Consider the invitation of Jesus Christ in Matthew 11. Verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. And in John 10, I remind you that he said to his apostles, I am gentle as your shepherd, the good shepherd, I will lead you to pasture. The idea, although specifically feeding here is not mentioned explicitly, it is implicit in the satisfaction of our souls, being fed in the word of God as the Spirit applies it. And then, if you will, please turn to John 7. Again, another invitation. Verse 37. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to John 6, verse 53 and following. Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. I would find it difficult to discover any passage that more closely ties together feeding on Jesus Christ with the presence of Christ in us. This morning as we were praying together, one mentioned the Spirit dwelling in us. That's Christ's presence in us, abiding in us by means of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that comes to those who've eaten Christ's flesh and drunk his blood. Well, we do know the Jews were offended at that language, but praise be to God, we understand what it means that Jesus Christ incarnate is so inseparable from the truth of God that he's called the bread of life and the living water. And then, lest we think it's only for the present Hear what John had to say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Revelation 22. In Revelation 22, verse 17, we find these words. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. Who is the bride? You know, do you not? The bride is the redeemed. So here's the Holy Spirit at the very end of Scripture and the redeemed in the courts of heaven saying something. And what do they say? Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, 
And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Again, the idea of satisfying our appetite both for food and for drink. So what are those who refuse the invitation? Well, we can say they had no reverence and have no reverence or love for their king or the king's son or the wedding of the king's son, which is the, of course, uniting of redeemed believers to Jesus Christ as our head. They unblushingly put their own agenda ahead of their kings. I submit that describes the United States today. And I think we're very foolish if we don't recognize that that same tendency can creep into the visible church to put our own agenda before that of the king. We have, I think, no presumption in saying they had no regard for the king's son or for the wedding of the king's son. In other words, his bride, the church. And these guests were also indifferent to the king's laws. He had commanded them to attend. They disregarded it. And one of the marks of those who take lightly the invitation to feast, ultimately, at the wedding feast of the Lamb, is they are law breakers and law despisers. They are also ones who had no fellowship or desire for fellowship with the king, his son, or his guests. This morning my heart was touched in the time of prayer that the thanking God for the privilege of fellowship was raised as an important reason to give thanks. And think for a minute If you go to a banquet and nobody's there, even if food is spread and you eat, there's something clearly missing, is there not? Can you imagine going to a banquet with table sets for thousands and you're the only one there? Absurd. And so when we think about this concept of banquets and remembering Revelation 22, 17, you cannot separate in understanding the wedding feast of the Lamb. You cannot separate the lamb from his bride, of which, of course, we are a part. So the implications are profound that those who disregard the invitation of God to feed upon Jesus Christ and so be made alive will be punished severely. Matthew 22 again for a moment. Consider the segment of the parable that's devoted to the punishment of the unclothed, improperly clothed guest. Then the king said to the servants, verse 13, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus Christ, early in his public ministry, began to warn his hearers of being cast aside from the banquet of God. Matthew 8, in that marvelous account of the centurion at whose faith Christ marveled. Hear what he says to the Jews, Matthew 8, verse 10. Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel And I say to you that many shall come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a matter of great consequence. Every one of us in this room, every one of us in this city, and everyone on the face of the earth has been invited to the banquet, and many refuse, as the parable indicated. So what do you and I do with this parable? What are we going to do by way of application? Well, first of all, I think it's a good start to ask ourselves, do I rejoice in being a recipient of the invitation of Jesus Christ? 
Is that a source of gladness that I've heard the gospel? That I've not been in darkness as people in remote countries in the Middle East and the, in Asia and places like that in the jungles of South America. We've heard the gospel. We've heard the gracious invitation. And we understand that to which we are invited. And so then a second question follows quite naturally. Am I regularly feeding on the bread of life and drinking the living waters? That is Jesus Christ. I would hope none of us would be so careless as to suggest that we could never be tempted to take for granted that which is precious. We all need refreshment in the spirit and the word. We all need revitalizing from time to time. We all need an awakening from time to time. It's not without accident that God says to the church, awake you that sleep, arise, be alert. Those words came from the mouth of Christ a number of times. So what's a properly dressed guest who does appreciate the invitation and who has come to the banquet? Well, there's many texts I could go to, but I believe the best summary text is in 2 Corinthians 5. I suspect many of you know this verse by heart. Verse 21. He, that is God the Father, made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This parable, rightly understood, calls us to marvel, to rejoice, to give thanks, and to cling to the truth that the righteousness of Christ is the only righteousness which enables us to stand in the presence of Almighty God. You and I, if we've understood the gospel, know that it's his shed blood that washes away our sin, his broken body, it satisfies the divine justice of God, the just and holy justice of God, and his hatred of sin, and his punishment of sin. Jesus bore the punishment we deserve, as it says here. Uh, he made him to be sin on our behalf. He was identified with our sin. But you and I also need to understand that as surely as our sins are, have been imputed to Christ, if we indeed have believed in truth, so Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And we do well to regularly thank God and confess our clinging to that marvelous truth that Jesus Christ's righteousness enables us to be in God's presence without being cast, hand and foot bound into utter, utter darkness. And so as believers... This parable, rightly understood, calls us to confess our utter dependence upon God. Not only are we dependent upon being the recipients of the invitation, we're dependent upon the grace to understand it, to appreciate its significance. We're dependent upon God for the grace to respond. And I suspect every one of us in this room knows people who have heard the gospel and are indifferent. And you and I, I hope, know that were it not for the sanctifying and saving work of the Holy Spirit, we would be just the same. This parable, rightly understood, calls us as part of setting our mind on Christ, as Paul speaks of in Colossians, setting our mind on the inheritance of the wedding feast. Because you and I, if we are redeemed, are part of that bride, the bride of Jesus Christ, the church. Should I treasure that? Please, God. Turn once more, if you will, to Revelation, this time to chapter 19. Revelation 19, beginning with verse 5. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, 
and the sound of many waters, and it's the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. There's the righteousness of Christ. And then the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, which is impossible without Christ's work, of course. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you rejoicing this day? in your invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you believe you've been invited? And if you believe you've been invited, are you treasuring that invitation? Did you ever get an invitation to a party and in the busyness of life set it down somewhere and then you couldn't find it? You ever have that happen? Well, it's happened at the Needham household, you know. Um, my desk is messy. Things get lost. And... I was, couldn't help chuckling last night when my brother Greg did a nominal apology for the mess of his study, and I thought, this is nothing compared to the mess in my study. And so it's easy to let the minutia of life get in the way of what's important. But as we come to this table, I remind you, this table is part of God's not only preparing us, but preserving us to indeed end up at the table of the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. Here in symbolic form, we can use that word, in the type of Jesus Christ, the bread and the cup, are reminding us of a great banquet to come. And while the t pieces of food are small in communion, and the drinks are, the cups of wine are small. Let not their minuscule size seduce us into being blind to the greatness of what they represent. You and I have a great privilege of coming to a sacramental feast prepared by Jesus Christ to remind us of the great feast to which we've been invited as his bride. So with a couple of final texts, I want to point out by way of a PS that if you think about it, heaven is not all that easy for us to understand. But some of it can be understood as an antithesis to hell. And the parable has reflected that at the end. For does not hell have as one of its terrible properties unending and raging ghastly thirst? And we can quite properly assume, although it's not addressed specifically, that in hell there's gnawing and raging hunger that is never satisfied. It's one of the many torments. We're made as creatures of dust. Though we will have glorified bodies, there will still be a similarity to our present being and that we will be feasting in heaven. And how can we say that? Well, in Revelation 22, we have some other reminders. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have a right to the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Would you 
consider the promise of God to satisfy our needs for eternity, a marvelous part of being invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's not the primary point, but certainly it's one that hopefully would stimulate us to come to this table with the desire to partake of the elements as thankfully and eagerly as possible to be refreshed in the spiritual appetite, please God, that we know without which our lives are empty. John 6. John 6, beginning with verse 53. Jesus therefore said to them, repeating this because it's so profound, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. When we partake of the elements, spiritually, that is exactly what we are doing. If we partake according to what the scripture teaches. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And then finally, Revelation 7. Revelation 7, verse 9. And after these things I looked, behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, of all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. One of the elders answered, saying to me, Those, those are... Those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they, and from where have they come? And I said to him, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who've come out of the great tribulation and have, made, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them, and they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more. Amen. Let's pray. Father,